introduce our speaker. Dr. Calliope Holing is a research faculty member at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders at Kennedy Krieger Institute. As a psychiatric epidemiologist by training, she also has a joint academic appointment as an assistant professor from the Department of Mental Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now I will turn this over to Dr. Holing. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having me and thank you everyone for, for joining. I'm, I'm delighted to be here talking about the connections between the gut, autism and mental health. So first I'm just gonna give you a brief outline of what I'm gonna cover. Um, I imagine autism is sort of not a foreign concept to most of you, but I will just take a minute to just describe it. Um, talk about why I believe we should care about autism and GI symptoms. And I apologize, I'm just moving my chat over here. Um, pathways linking GI symptoms or gut dysregulation with autism. I'll give a brief overview of sort of the history of autism gut microbiome research, and then close on some approaches to identifying GI symptoms in autistic individuals. So what is autism spectrum disorder or ASD? This is the clinical criteria that I've listed here from DSM-5. So autism is defined as having sort of two broad domains of symptoms or impairments or traits, depending how you want to think about it. One is repetitive behaviors and interests, and the other is social and communication impairments. Importantly, these need to be present in the early developmental period, need to cause significant impairment in multiple areas of functioning like social or occupational, and symptoms need to not be better explained by intellectual disability or a global developmental delay. It's really important to note that autism is extremely heterogeneous. And one of the things that makes it such is the presence of many different co-occurring conditions. And so this is just a schematic showing some of that heterogeneity. We see those two broad domains of symptoms in the middle surrounded by a number of co-occurring things um, and, and other things like intellectual disability, language skill, adaptive functioning, which, which varies across people. So um, a lot of differences in terms of physical health, mental health, behavioral health conditions across the life course. Now, why should we care specifically about autism and GI symptoms? So broadly, um, you know, I think the issue of, of physical health is very important to study um, for a few reasons. We know that individuals with autism often have very complex health needs. Research shows us that autistic individuals tend to use more healthcare services, have higher costs associated with their healthcare, more ED visits, and more inpatient hospitalizations. Yet this population unfortunately still experiences a lot of unmet health needs and lower quality of care. And I really see this as an equity issue because health affects everything. I'm sure we can all empathize with the experience of being sick, whether that's sort of a brief acute sickness or something that is more chronic and how disabling either of those things can be to multiple domains of our life, our employment, our relationships, our quality of life. Um, so again, I really see this as an, equ as an equity issue. Um, in terms of GI symptoms specifically, we know that they're incredibly common. Now, for reasons that I'll sort of elaborate on a little bit later in the talk, the GI symptom estimates vary quite drastically across the research literature. So this, uh, these are numbers from a sort of meta-analysis that, um, that I published a few years ago now. And what we found is that across basically all of the autism literature since 1980 that was looking at GI symptoms, um, on average, 22% of the samples reported constipation, 23% diarrhea, 14% abdominal pain or other abdominal discomfort. And if we took an aggregate of any type of GI symptoms beyond just these three, but, but really anything, so things like reflux as well, nearly a half of all study populations had um, GI symptoms. And that's, that's quite a, a substantial number. 
In addition to these um, GI symptoms, there were a lot of co-occurring issues. So things like food sensitivities or preferences, difficulties around mealtime or toileting. And then one important note is that currently there isn't any evidence that there's an autism specific gut pathology. And so what I mean by that is that it seems that autistic individuals are more likely to experience GI issues for a number of reasons, which I'll get into shortly. Um, but there's not something sort of inherent about autism itself that um, that is causing that pathology. That That is sort of um, a, as far as we know with, with the latest research. As I mentioned, GI symptoms often co-occur with a, a number of other conditions. So there have been strong links with comorbidities like seizures or sleep disorders. Um, as you can imagine, constipation has been linked with worse behavioral symptoms, with increased stress and anxiety, and with an increased cortisol response. So to really frame why I think this is an issue that we should care about and, and that matters, I, I'd like to take a few moments to share some findings from um, a couple qualitative or mixed method studies. So the first one is a study that um, that is published in, in Autism, the journal, um, in 2022. And this describes a qualitative study of families with autistic children that also have these GI issues. And we really just wanted to understand what are the experiences that these children and that these families faced. And so we advertise this qualitative study to local autism groups. I live in the Baltimore, Maryland area. So these are folks in the, in the you know, DC, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland area. We recruited parents of, child, of children that have autism and a history of GI symptoms. And we held about a, a dozen interviews. This was pre-pandemic. So um, a lot of them happened in person. Some of them happened by video or phone. And then we carried out an inductive analysis, which means that we really derived themes based off of what our study participants were telling us, rather than sort of pre-imposing uh, pre, uh, our, um, our own notions or, or beliefs onto the data. And so this first theme, um, we'll come back to this later in the talk, and I'll, I'll just note what it is for now, is that as you, as you can imagine, uh, many of the autistic children had a difficulty verbally communicating when they were experiencing GI symptoms. So again, we'll come back to this. I won't dwell on it for now, but that was sort of theme number one. Theme number two, and this really speaks to the issue of impact, was that GI issues impacted the child's well-being and ability to participate and fully engage in activities. So this included things like attending school, focusing during class, what accommodations they needed in a school setting. It also influenced things outside of class, like social and extracurricular activities. And more broadly, these GI issues affected the child's emotional and overall well-being. So this is a quote from the parent of an autistic child from our study. And they note, when he, the, their autistic son, is not right in his gut, the whole world isn't right. A lot of his behavior and his issues really crop up when he's constipated. He will get in trouble more. He will lose privileges. He will get low point chart numbers from school. It impacts his daily life. So again, really speaking to just the, the broad impact that these symptoms can have on a child's life. The next theme was that the child's GI issues impacted the family's well-being as a whole. So things like the overall temperament and well-being of the household, parental distress and frustration, the family's ability to go out. Um, this includes things like restaurants, of course, because these GI symptoms are often food related, but more broadly, just ability to go out, take a walk, take vacations, that sort of thing. Um, even the family's financial health and stress was sometimes affected um, by these symptoms. So this is another quote um, by, a, by a parent saying, it's painful as a parent to have to try and do something that's uncomfortable or out of the norm to your child, just because, you know, they, they don't really care for it. And I think in this instant, the parent was talking about needing to actually help their child relieve some of this GI pain and some of the treatments that the child had to go through and how difficult that was as a parent to have to participate in a therapy that clearly was making the child uncomfortable and yet had to be done to relieve that GI pain. So, you know, I imagine a very, a very difficult situation as a parent. 
And then um, the last theme, and you know, this won't be terribly surprising, I think, to many of you, unfortunately, but parents often experience challenges with seeking accessible and affordable health care for their child's GI problems. So parents noted lengthy and complicated processes for making health care appointments. When they did have the appointment, the medical offices often weren't really conducive to the child's autism because of sensory overwhelm, for example. Parents reported that Oftentimes, healthcare providers lacked the experience or training in treating children with autism with these complex medical needs. Sadly, parents sometimes reported not being taken seriously by providers due to the child's um, autism. And there are important consequences of these challenges. So I think you can imagine that as a parent, if you're consistently sort of feeling dismissed or unsupported by the traditional healthcare uh, field, you might turn to other sources of information or support. Um, and this is where things get really tricky because a lot of the sort of therapies and strategies that you might hear about on blogs or, you know, on social media aren't supported um, in, in by research in terms of um, their safety or their effectiveness. And yet, parents and individuals are often desperate to try something. And so this puts people in a really difficult situation. Um, and this is just uh, an example of, of that, that theme. So I think some of the issues that happen are more complex and they, the providers, are expecting a child to come in with a fever and you know figure out the cause of that fever and whether or not they require medication. And that's the end of it. We have a lot of ongoing issues and things that may affect other things and it's just more complex. So hopefully I have um, convinced you of sort of the importance of why we should care about this issue in children. Uh, what about an autistic adult? So this has been a relatively underexplored area and um, I'm gonna present some sort of preliminary findings from a study we're doing exploring this question. So this is a mixed methods, meaning there's a qual qualitative and quantitative integration of data. Uh, research project partnering with the autistic community. And our goals were twofold. First is similar to this study that I, I just shared with children and their families. Um, the, the, the primary goal here was to understand the experiences, needs, and priorities of autistic adults as they pertain to GI health and related issues. And then second, based off of these findings and in collaboration with our community board, we want to develop recommendations for potential services, interventions, tools, or policies to help improve the GI health of this population. And so I just want to take a moment to make sort of a shout out to our, our wonderful study team. This was truly a beautiful team effort. Um, these are some of our participant facing individuals, um, as well as members of our community board. Um, and so the, the key findings were that in many instances, GI symptoms had profound and extensive negative impacts on many or all areas of life. So one autistic adult, for example, shared, I don't know if I'll ever be able to hold down a full time job or not. Will I ever be able to date or do anything? And just to clarify, this this adult isn't speaking about um, impairments um, or disability to their autism broadly, um, but to the GI symptoms specifically that they're experiencing as an autistic person. So not being able to hold down a job or date because specifically of the severity of those GI symptoms. Oftentimes, uh, participants told us that common triggers included things like stress, sensory overwhelm, and changes in routine or food, though other times triggers were not always apparent. And this was actually a point of a lot of frustration, is not being able to identify what was causing their symptoms and therefore not you know, having a lot of power or control over preventing them. Some more key findings are that most autistic adults and parents describe primarily frustrating or unhelpful healthcare interactions. This is very similar to what I just shared with you in terms of the pediatric literature. So autistic adults or their parents reported that the system was, um, was often difficult, unpleasant, expensive to navigate. Healthcare providers were often dismissive and didn't offer useful diagnoses or advice. Um, one person noted, you know, they weren't concerned at all. Uh, and then autistic adults relied on um, medications, extensive planning and preparation before going anywhere, avoiding triggers that they were aware of, um, and then positive supports as well, such as family or friends to help them prevent or manage um, 
their symptoms. So I won't read this whole list, but these are some potential areas of recommendation that our team felt um, we wanted to raise as sort of practical um, implementation next steps. So things like healthcare provider trainings, perhaps advocacy trainings for autistic adults. Um, I'll, I'll, um, these slides will be freely available to you. And, and so you're welcome to sort of peruse this a little bit more. And then I've also included just the QR code here for um, a recorded presentation about this study of GI symptoms in autistic adults um, that I gave to AIRP, which is one of the, um, the funders of this study. That's the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health. So if you want to know more, I invite you to, to check that out. Again, these are preliminary findings um, and we're, we're really eager to share sort of the final results soon when we, when we have those. So next I'd like to move to potential pathways that are linking GI symptoms or gut dysregulation with autism. And the next slide are gonna be very sort of simplistic in nature. This is meant to just be a sort of a conceptual schematic, but I find it helpful in talking, talking through and thinking through the ways that these domains might be related. So first thinking about how um, having autism or being autistic may predispose someone to having GI issues. Um, and so there are a couple ways that, that this could happen, a couple obvious ways. The first is the presence of co-occurring conditions. So you could imagine um, because individuals with autism are predisposed to having a number of co-occurring conditions, things like sleep, sleep disturbances, anxiety, seizure disorders, um, immune conditions, something about those conditions themselves and not necessarily the autism may be increasing the likelihood of GI issues. And so a common example is anxiety. Anxiety is incredibly prevalent in the autistic community. It can be incredibly disabling for many reasons, including the fact that I think we're all intuitive with the idea that if we're feeling really anxious, our, you know, our uh, GI system may be more sensitive, right? And so that's sort of one um, indirect way that autism might influence um, likelihood of having GI issues. Similarly, medications that people take for these co-occurring conditions. So this could be a medication like an SSRI or perhaps a medication for a seizure condition. Um, the medication itself may have GI issues as a side effect. Another really big um, domain through which autism may affect GI issues is diet. So it's, um, it's quite common for autistic individuals to have sort of unusual diets in that they may be restricted to particular foods or food types or food textures. This, be this may be because of um, really strong sensory um, aversions or, or preferences. Um, and so it's not uncommon for me to hear about individuals that... Um, are really quite restricted in terms of the foods that they're eating. And so you could imagine a situation in which if someone is avoiding um, fiber, let's say entirely, because they really can only tolerate eating um, like plain yellow foods, like, um, like white bread, let's say, then that lack of fiber may in turn, in fact, uh, may in turn impact their GI symptoms. Um, so again, that's just sort of um, one, one broad way that, that those may be connected. And then, of course, there are issues with the gut itself or with GI symptoms that may influence autism or related behaviors. And so the first, I think, is the most intuitive, and that's simply that when folks aren't feeling well in terms of their belly, they're going to be experiencing discomfort, distress, potentially pain. And those things show up as behaviors, right? So I'm sure we can all appreciate that if we're having, you know, GI discomfort, we may not show up to interactions as our best selves. You know, we we may be more irritable. We may be more anxious. We may have less patience with people. Um, and so, of course, those those things aren't autism behaviors themselves, but they can be co-occurring conditions that we often see in autism. And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of um, so sometimes some of these behaviors that are noticed in autistic individuals and other people with developmental disabilities could actually be due to sort of this undiagnosed and untreated um, medical conditions, and in, in this case, GI issues. Um, so I, I think that's an important, you know, consideration that when when we see behavior like this, what might be what might be driving it? 
And then the second big domain is what I've loosely here just called biology. And there are a lot of things that can fall under this. Um, so potential biological pathways that sort of connect the gut with autism might be things like the microbiome, which I'll get into in just a few minutes, um, the vagus nerve, metabolic products, um, serotonin production that are actually produced by our microbiome, modulation of the immune system, a permeability of the gut, which affects which substances um, stay inside sort of the, the lumen or the inside of our GI tract, as opposed to get into the bloodstream and more pathways. Um, and so that, you know, we could, we could spend days talking about all of those things, but that's sort of the other broad domain of, of, um, of risk factors. So next I wanna give a, a sort of brief historical overview of this field of autism and the gut microbiome specifically. So in the early 2000s is when we really started to see some strong initial observations um, for this connection between autism and the microbiome. So this research field was spurred by both anecdotal reports and case study reports of um, changes in autism related behaviors that seemed to coincide with illness or antibiotic exposure. And so that led researchers to begin to, to study this, uh, this, um, this field more, more closely. And, and what we started to see is um, differences in the gut microbiota of autistic individuals compared to neurotypical controls. And so this has sparked further interest in, in this field of the gut-brain access. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, in particular, these studies were very preliminary, often had small sample sizes, but they did uh, lay the groundwork for future research. And I've just highlighted sort of an exemplar uh, paper of sort of the early 2000s um, that, that sort of started to, to set the field in motion. In the mid to late 2000s, this is where we really started to establish the field of the gut-brain access. So studies began to more firmly establish this concept, the idea that the gut and the brain are bi-directional, um, and, and research started to suggest that the gut microbiota might actually influence brain function and behavior and even potentially autism symptoms. So again, I've noted sort of an exemplar publication here. Um, in the 2010s, this is where we start getting into microbiome diversity and specific strains. So we start getting a little bit more granular. So research started to explore the diversity of the micro microbiome. So this is, you know, how many microbes and how many different types of microbes um, are present. Um, looking in autistic individuals versus neurotypical individuals. And on average, what the research has found is reduced microbial diversity um, in autistic individuals, as well as alterations in specific bacterial strains. Um, and so studies started to you know, identify how certain um, gut microbial profiles were associated with autism and began to sort of explore how those altered profiles might influence neurodevelopment and, um, and behavior. And from 2015 onwards is where we really started to get into intervention studies. So instead of just sort of observing um, microbiome alterations and documenting those associations, starting to try to actually manipulate the microbiome and see what happens in terms of behavior. Um, and, and so some examples of these interventions are things like probiotics, prebiotics, fecal microbiota transplantation, which I'll get into a little bit more soon. Um, and these studies have shown promising but, but varied results um, and really highlight the complexity of this gut-brain access and also the need for, for personalized approach. Um, and, I'll, and I'll elaborate a little bit on, on this too, but I just want to note it since it's not in the slides, it is I think these, um, these studies have also highlighted the importance of really studying the safety of these interventions and the acceptability of these interventions by the autistic community. So recent trends and ongoing research is that the focus has really started to shift towards trying to understand the mechanisms by which the gut microbiome influences brain and behavior. So pathways that I've mentioned, such as immune system modulation, production of neurotransmitters or hormone, hormones, um, direct neural pathways, et cetera. Also, there's been increasing interest in how the environment, so things like um, diet, early life, antibiotic exposures, how those things may influence the gut microbiome and the development of autism. 
And then ongoing research is exploring the potential for, again, modulating the gut microbiome as a therapeutic strategy for autism with a focus on long-term outcomes and safety. Um, and, and I just want to be mindful of, of this last point and what I mean by a therapeutic strategy for autism. So I, of course, can't speak for all of the autism researchers that are that are doing this work when I'm sort of considering the possibilities, um, the possibility for therapies for autism, I'm really focused on the co-occurring conditions that autistic individuals um, report as very disabling. So for example, things like GI symptoms or anxiety, um, rather than sort of the autism itself. Um, so I, I, I just want to sort of give that qualifying statement in terms of, in terms of how I'm using that phrase. So Globally, when we look at the gut microbiome literature in autism, we see that multiple distinct microbiota populations or microbes have been associated with autism. This has been mostly in the pediatric population because um, studies in adults are unfortunately still very rare. Uh, but the findings have been really highly divergent or inconsistent across studies. Um, and, and I just want to highlight a few of, few of those reasons. Um, one is that, as I mentioned, the, the early studies in particular, but even today's, um, are, are relatively small, right? These are small cohorts of individuals, so there's going to be quite a bit of noise there. In different studies, there are sometimes different comparison groups. So some studies are comparing autistic individuals to unrelated neurotypical controls, sometimes comparing them to unaffected siblings, sometimes comparing to... Um, non-autistic but not neurotypical controls. So there's a lot of uh, sort of variability and, and all of that is going to assess, um, or sorry, a lot of that is going to influence the type of differences that we see in microbes across these different populations. There's also been um, a failure, and this has really started to change, but um, especially in the early days, a failure to control for potential confounders. So things like diet, antibiotics, um, that should read medication, I apologize, things that are associated with both microbiome and autism, and that might be sort of biasing this association. As I noted at the beginning, there's an incredible amount of heterogeneity in the autistic population. And so a lot of this inconsistency that we see in microbiome studies might simply be due to that heterogeneity. I think that's an important thing to consider, um, is that there isn't going to be a single sort of microbiome signature in autism, but there are potentially a lot of sort of different signatures of the microbiome, just like there are in, in any human population. There's also some methodologic concerns, so variations in what techniques are used, um, what happens in the laboratory, uh, what, even what geographic location the research has taken place in. All of these things can affect what microbes are identified. Um, and lastly, uh, this may not have been obvious, but a lot of the times when we're talking about gut microbiome, we're actually referring to the microbiome that is um, collected in stool rather than the actual microbes in the intestinal mucosa. For obvious reasons, it's hard and usually not ethical to simply, uh, you know, take swabs from, take biopsies from a person's intestine um, just for research purposes. And, uh, and, and so we, we sometimes have to approximate, we often have to approximate what microbes we think are there by studying what's in the stool. Um, but that, of course, can, um, can again lead to some discrepancies depending on what the particular study is doing. And then I, I sort of just want to highlight this, this difference that, you know, some of the autism microbiome research is focused on understanding the role of the microbiome in individuals who have an autism diagnosis, who, you know, have had autism for several to many years slash their whole lifetimes, um, and sort of trying to explore the, the role of the microbiome in the presentation of their autism and in co-occurring conditions. Um, but there's also this field of trying to understand the role of the gut and the microbiome in the development of autism. And so I'll just highlight a couple important points here is, is that we know, particularly from animal studies, that the maternal gut microbiome, meaning the microbiome of the pregnant mother or pregnant um, female animal uh, interacts with her immune system and the development of the offspring's immune system. So animal studies really show that this interaction influences brain development and behavior in a lot of important ways. 
As you can imagine, these studies are a lot harder to do in humans, but have started to be done. And there's ongoing research. Um, and I've highlighted some studies at the bottom um, and all of my resource, my references are at the end. So you can feel free to explore that um, a bit more. But um, but this research is starting to be done, which is which is exciting. And and what we've really started to appreciate is that these early life exposures, things like delivery mode, diet, breastfeeding, medications in early life really shape the development of the infant microbiome. And then so the next big question is um, figuring out how that early microbiome development influences the child's health, including their neurodevelopment and behavior. As I mentioned, there are a number of different types of microbial interventions. So diet is um, really one of the biggest influences of the gut microbiome. And it's something that most of us um, have, you know, a fair bit of control over. Um, so diet and microbial interventions hold a lot of promise um, because they are modifiable. And unlike something like, you know, our DNA sequences, which is mostly static across the life course, um, our gut microbiome can change quite a bit throughout our life course. Um, and it's this sort of plasticity or ability to be modified that what that's what makes it as exciting as a potential intervention. Um, we are seeing that the effects of different interventions tend to vary a lot across different people. So one big sort of um, domain of research is trying to understand which type of person might respond more or less um, to particular micro microbial interventions. But some of the common microbial therapies include, of course, antibiotics, probiotics, which we define as the live beneficial bacteria. Um, these can be found in foods like yogurt, miso, fermented vegetables, prebiotics. The distinction here is that prebiotics are the actual food that the probiotics use. So these are things like garlic, bananas, oats, and then of course, fecal transplants or fecal microbi micro microbiota transplants, excuse me, and I'll get into that um, a little bit more here. Um, so the basic idea behind a fecal transplant is that an individual with a, a health condition would, um, would basically be given donor feces from a healthy donor. And there's a lot of screening that goes underway to make sure the sample is safe um, and that the donor doesn't have health conditions, which could potentially be transmitted to the recipient. There's a lot of processing, of course, um, that, that takes place with the sample. And then there's the delivery of the sample. So this could be through endoscopy, either via the mouth or the rectum, or in pill form. There are even some approaches that are sort of in a, in a drink form. It's obviously not the stool itself, but the microbes in the stool. Um, so there, there's, of course, a, a bit of an ick factor here. But um, these fecal transplants actually uh, were started to help treat uh, C. difficile which is, can be a very serious infection, um, potentially fatal. And in severe cases of individuals that really weren't responding to any other treatments, um, clinicians and researchers found that these fecal transplants sometimes restored um, the healthy microbiota to, to an individual um, and, and helped them finally overcome this, this disease, this infection. Um, and so since there has been more effort uh, looking into how fecal transplants um, might benefit people with other health conditions. Um, one of those health conditions is autism, and this has been a bit controversial. Um, here are just a couple screenshots of some of two of the studies that have been done looking at this microbiota transfer therapy. So the purpose, uh, the goal was to assess whether a modified fecal microbiota transplant was safe and tolerable in the autism population and whether it improved GI or autism symptoms. So there was a, a treatment group of 18 children with autism that had moderate to severe GI problems, a control group of 20 typically developing children that didn't have GI disorders. This was an open label cl clinical trial, which means that the participants knew what they were getting. There wasn't a placebo control, it wasn't randomized. Um, and then the intervention itself for those that received it was a 14 day course of vancomycin, which is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Movi prep, which essentially flushes out the bowel, um, the microbiota themselves, of course. Um, for some participants, this was given orally. For some, it was given rectally. 
and prilosec, which is an acid inhibitor and allows those microbes to um, sort of survive the acidity of the stomach and then go on to hopefully colonize the, the colon or the gut. And so in the study, parents collected stool samples, GI symptoms, autism symptoms, and global impressions about their child's behavior and development. In terms of what the microbiome changes were, um, so first at baseline or at the very beginning of the study, the, the children with autism had um, gut bacteria that were less diverse compared to the control group. But um, the researchers found that that, di that diversity increased throughout the treatment. And by the end of the, the study, that diversity level was similar to that of the control group, um, which is you know what we're what we're looking for. Um, the donor bacteria at least partially engrafted in the recipient's gut, which mean that those there was you know some long term uh, change in the composition of the gut microbiome, and there were specific uh, microbiomes that that changed significantly with the treatment, including Bifidobacterium, Prevotella and desulfovibrio. Uh, and then in terms of the actual sort of phenotypic changes, um, the authors, uh, the investigators found that both some behavioral and some GI symptoms um, improved. So in terms of GI symptoms, abdominal pain, indigestion, constipation and diarrhea improved. The um, average score on the gastrointestinal symptom rating scale improved and the days with abnormal or no stools um, decreased. There was also an improvement in behaviors like social responsiveness, autism severity, and just global parent impression. There was a significant negative correlation between the change in the GI and the autism scores, which in this case means that as the GI symptoms improved, the autism behaviors reduced, so to say. Um, there was an average increase in the developmental age of the children throughout the study, and the researchers found that the, the treatment was generally well tolerated. There were some temporary adverse effects like hyperactivity, tantrums, or aggression. So I think this is a promising study and um, understandably it's received quite a bit of attention. It's not been without controversy, of course. Uh, what I wanna highlight are some of the limitations and I think some of the um, important things to, to keep in mind as we're interpreting this study. First, of course, is a methodological issue. This isn't a placebo-controlled, bland, blinded, or randomized study. So that's just a methodologic concern. And to really, truly understand that causal effect of a probiotic, um, of a, a microbiota transplant, excuse me, um, we would need sort of ideally a randomized, blinded control study. Um, Dis disentangling the different effects um, of different parts of treatment, for example, the antibiotic versus the bowel cleanse versus the microbes versus the acid inhibitor. I, th I personally think that's, um, that's important because we know that people may respond differently to these different components and their interactions. Um, as I have briefly alluded to, and as I'll get into a little bit more very soon, the assessment of GI symptoms in the autism population, it can be very challenging. Um, and, and that is a limitation of the field broadly and of this study as well. And then as, as I've mentioned, of course, autism is very heterogeneous. This was a relatively small study of children with moderate to severe GI issues. So you can imagine that the findings may not be generalizable to the whole autism spectrum. The last two bolded points are the ones I, I really want to drive home, though, is, you know, assuming that this that this treatment was actually effective. Um, to me, there's an important distinction between whether the improvements in autism symptoms are due to the microbiota themselves, like actually influencing the brain. Or whether it's the fact that this this um, treatment actually helped reduce GI symptoms and children are simply feeling better for that reason. Um, and, and to me, both of these things would would be exciting, um, but definitely have implications in terms of next steps for for research and clinical practice. So I'm going to try to leave about 10 minutes for questions, which leaves me eight minutes for the lecture. So I'm going to fly through the rest of this a little bit quickly. Um, but what I want to touch on is sort of just the challenge of um, identifying GI symptoms in autistic individuals. So first, I want to sort of make a distinction between symptoms and signs. 
Here I'm using symptoms as phenomena that can only be described by the person that's the one feeling them. So things like abdominal pain, the sensation of nausea, a burning sensation in the throat, these can really only be experienced by a person and then communicated to someone else by saying something like, my belly hurts, or can be communicated by signs. And what I mean by signs are things that can be observed by someone else, either with their own eyes. Um, I apologize, there's a phrase missing on the end of that, either with their own eyes or with a tool like a thermometer, for example. Um, so in, in the case of the of GI signs, this could be things like diarrhea, vomiting, a sweaty forehead, perhaps, or an individual clutching their stomach. So why, why am I sort of spending the time stressing this? Well, there are often obstacles to having these GI symptoms recognized. So children in general can have trouble communicating pain and other subjective experiences. Um, in autistic individuals, there may be additional barriers like impairments in introception, language impairments, intellectual disability, the social world context of the fact that an autistic individual may go into a health provider and sort of want to communicate that they're experiencing GI symptoms, but perhaps the provider isn't trained in this area and thinks it's just due to the autism. Um, and, and so all in all, this, this has led um, me and, and other researchers in this space to really feel like we need tools that are specific to individuals with autism or other neurodevelopmental disabilities for assessing these GI symptoms. So this is a big measurement challenge. Um, I just highlighted um, a paper from a few years ago in which uh, this was the paper in which we looked at sort of that spread of GI symptom estimates and how it varied across different studies. And intuitively, what we found is that the symptom estimates vary depending on how you measure the symptoms. So whether it's a parent report questionnaire, whether it's, um, you know, a physician assessment, whether it's something in the medical record. All of these things are going to vary the actual uh, are going to influence the the actual symptom estimate. Um, there, are a lot of the existing measures that have been used have important limitations. Um, many of them weren't weren't designed with the autistic population in mind, and so that th there has been a, bi a big push in the last um, you know five to ten years to to try to change this. Um, this is that that qualitative study that I mentioned at the very beginning, and I just want to highlight that major theme that I sort of skipped over, is that children with neurodevelopmental disabilities and autism here specifically, even those that have fluent speech, often have often have a difficult time communicating the presence of their GI symptoms, um, and so oftentimes parents relied on detecting things like bodily signs, things like the visible abdominal swelling or diarrhea, lack of bod bodily uh, bowel movements, or nonverbal behaviors or changes, things like sleep issues, irritability, aggression, in order to know that their child was experiencing GI symptoms. Um, these are a few quotes, which I, I invite you to sort of um, to, to read later. I'll just keep moving in the interest of time. One thing I want to highlight is this last quote, because it is just so heart-wrenching to me. Um, this is a parent describing um, their their child, their autistic child's um, behavior when she's experiencing GI symptoms. So the parent says, when the stomach hurts, there's an almost immediate physical reaction. She could scream, she could throw things. And after she calms down, she then tells us, my tummy hurts. Every time the police had to come out because she was being really destructive, first thing she would say as she regained her composure was, my tummy hurts. This is part wrenching for a number of reasons. Um, it obviously shows why I care about this topic, why I think it's important, but also it shows this link between behavior and GI pain and why I think sometimes um, behaviors that are written off as just being part of the autism are in fact reflective of something else going on, in this case, um, GI pain, presumably. So, you know, the, the big take home here is I believe we need autism specific GI instruments. Um, this not only hinders research, but clinical care. There are efforts under underway by myself and by others in the field to develop and validate um, GI screeners for this population. Um, one such tool is called the GERBI, the Gastrointestinal and Related Behavior Inventory. This was a product of a lot of different things, literature review, talking to families, leveraging existing tools like the Autism Treatment Network GI Inventory, 
um, and the brief autism mealtime behavior um, inventory or the Bambi. And I've noted Dr. Tim Bowie and Dr. Colleen Lukens have been wonderful collaborators here on this. Um, so this tool, you know, assesses specific GI symptoms, frequency of bowel movements, mealtime dietary behaviors, but importantly, other motor or other behaviors that may be indicative of GI symptoms when someone isn't able to sort of communicate that. So things like a child arching their back, gritting teeth, or even coughing, which sometimes we see um, in instances of reflux. So this questionnaire was piloted. Um, I won't sort of dwell on the results of this, but um, I've put the publication here if you want to, if you want to learn more. Um, but the, the take home here is that there's a lot of future work that needs to be done on GI measurement. So some of our next steps for this measure, the GERBY, is creating multiple versions to reach people across the autism spectrum and across the life course. So in the version that we piloted, it was only in individuals um, three to 17 years old. What we'd like to do is create a version that can be used by autistic adults or caregivers of autistic adults. We also want to create self-report and caregiver report versions, being mindful that for some individuals, it's going to be a caregiver that's completing it, but some autistic individuals have the ability to complete um, the self-report measure and they should, and, and that information from them will, will be best. Um, we, we'd like to do more clinical evaluation. We'd like to expand this to other neurodevelopmental conditions. So this isn't something that's specific to autism, but is actually seen in a lot of other neurodevelopmental disabilities. And we have some work underway um, looking at that, I think there's going to be a need for both these, you know, self-report or parent report questionnaires, as well as bi biological measures. So by including biosmessments like fecal samples, um, cytokines or physiologic measures like heart rate. Um, I, I think all of this in combination is going to be need to be used to really get the most accurate and reliable um, assessments of GI symptoms in this population. So in this last minute, I just want to thank my many wonderful collaborators, um, Kennedy, Creer, Kennedy Creer Institute and Johns Hopkins, where I'm located, as well as other institutions. Um, I want to thank the many funders of this work, um, without which this research simply wouldn't be possible. Um, I'd like to thank the participants of these research studies, the broader autism community, and I'd like to thank you, the attendees today. So. I've been seeing in the side of my eye that it, I, there seems like there are a lot of questions. So I'm gonna do my best to skim through these um, as quickly as possible in the remaining 10 minutes. Just a caveat that I am not a clinician, I'm a researcher and I also of course can't speak to individual, um, you know, individual questions about, about patients or people. So I'm gonna try to just skim and find sort of research related questions that I feel comfortable answering. Um, so anaphylactic food allergies, um, I anecdotally have heard that these are more common. Um, I'm not sure, sometimes the term allergies can be used quite broadly. I know that allergies and immune conditions are definitely more common in the autistic population. Whether that includes anaphylactic food allergies, I'm not 100% on. Um, I've indicated my contact information here. If there's a question that I didn't get to that you really want me to, I'm happy to, to follow up if, um, if, if you just send me a note about that. Um, diverticulitis, yes, my understanding is most GI, most specific GI conditions, including diverticulitis, um, seem to be um, more common. Um, I'm sorry to hear about this bringing up difficult memories. I know this can be a bit triggering, um, but I appreciate you listening. Um, gluten sensitive sensitivity versus celiac. Um, the research I've read, we see both of these being more common in the autism population. Um, I'm seeing some questions about recommended diets or sort of what to do with these symptoms. This is obviously the elephant in the room. Um, there is no particular diet or intervention in the autism population as a whole that's been shown to be, you know, safe and effective for everyone. What um, what I often tell families is to try to find a, a healthcare clinician, ideally a GI specialist, um, 
that is sort of serious about working with your family to try different things, really advocating for yourself or your your child or loved one to get the diagnostic evaluations that they need and not just let this written be written off as something that is part of the autism. Um, and then unfortunately, it does sometimes come down to, to trial and error um, and, and keeping a close, a close eye on the different things that you're trying for your health and what seems to help much like you would so, sort of for GI symptoms more broadly. Um, and, and I hate that I don't have a more definite answer, but that is unfortunately sort of this, the state of the field. You know, some people have said that specific diets help them like avoiding gluten or avoiding dairy. Um, other people haven't found that to be true and find those diets to be too limiting. Some people have reported that probiotics can be helpful. Other people have reported that probiotics aren't helpful or sometimes cause uh, or exacerbate their symptoms. So it's unfortunately a, a very frustrating state of affairs. Um, when you say autistic adults, do you mean those who can communicate effectively and do not have intellectual impairment? What about the most severely impaired adults? Great question. So um, when I'm using autistic adults, um, I'm simply using identity first language. So I do mean uh, adults with autism inclusive of those who cannot communicate effectively and that may have intellectual disability. Um, in the study of autistic adults that I mentioned, the way that we got around this was including parents of autistic adults that aren't able to participate themselves in the study because we wanted to make sure to capture the experiences of more severely impaired adults um, or adults that, um, that are minimally or, or nonverbal. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, let's see. Yeah, to anonymous question about sort of dead end. Um, yeah, this is this is unfortunately a frustrating experience. I, I would say trying as much as possible to find a, a clinician that will really work with you and is comfortable trying different things and seeing how um, your child responds to them. That's sort of the the best case scenario. And again, um, sort of pushing for the same evaluations that a neurotypical child might receive if, if that's appropriate. Um, da, 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 da. Yeah, uh, thoughts about people saying that they eliminated autism by healing the gut and changing diet. This is a great, great question. Um, as I mentioned at first, you know, my my stance on this is is I'm not approaching this research from um, from a, the perspective of trying to eliminate or cure or treat the autism itself, but rather co-occurring conditions that um, autistic individuals sort of want to modify. Um, and, and granted, I appreciate that some autistic individuals do want to eliminate their autism. So I. I respect that that's a stance as well. Um, I, I think this question does get at sort of the complexity of this topic though, and the heterogeneity across patients. Some people have indeed reported, and we've seen this in case reports too, that um, by substantially changing a diet or using other interventions that modify the microbiome, they've seen really substantial changes in behavior um, and sort of have, you know, claimed that autism can be healed in this way. You know, I, I, I sort of can't dispute um, one, one, one's own individual experience. I would say at this time in the field, we don't have good evidence um, for any therapy, including the diet, um, being able to modify autism related behaviors in such a way. Um, but but that is, of course, um, research that's that's ongoing. Um, C-sections, I would say this is particularly relevant in the microbiome field, looking at, you know, early life, early life factors that influence the infant microbiome development. So we know that the biggest thing that influences an infant's gut is whether they were born vaginally or by C-section. We don't yet know the implications of that in terms of the child's neurodevelopment, but there's a lot of active research going on to understand what those broad impacts are to the microbiome and subsequently to the child's health. So I would say stay tuned for that. Um, I'm trying to just skim to see what else I can answer. 
Uh, how do you find out if the child's microbiome's gut is healthy? You know, there are a lot of sort of um, tests out there to sort of claim to identify this. Uh, in the microbiome field, we're, we're actually still wrestling with the idea of what is a healthy microbiome and how you define that. Um, I, I would personally say if your child is experiencing GI symptoms or seems to be experiencing other GI related issues, then it makes sense to pay attention to this. And if they aren't, then maybe don't. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we know that a, a diverse microbiome in terms of having more microbes and different types of microbes that um, can offer resilience to different environmental exposures, that is sort of um, arguably the definition of a healthy microbiome. But, um, but we can't really point at this at this time to a microbiome and say like, this is the healthy microbiome and this is what we're going for. Um, please reach out to me um, if you're looking for recommendations of doctors in this area. I will, I will try to see what I can share with you. Uh, da, 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 da. So many questions. Um, trying to see if there's a last question that a lot of people are are asking. Yeah, and I, I appreciate this is frustrating because there's so much more research that needs to be done. Um, is there any scientific reason to think GI problems do not cause what we call autism in some individuals? Symptoms and signs, as you described before, do you know, um, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question. Um, I, we, we certainly don't have evidence at this point that anything going on in the gut causes autism in the first place. Um, that has been a, a bit of a controversial take, um, which I don't have time to get into, but there is simply no, no good research to indicate that. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not potentially happening, but again, there's, there's no research there. Um, what, what we do know is that these things strongly co-occur, which one happens first is, is sort of the big question. Um, I, I see I'm at two o'clock, so I, I think I'm going to have to stop here, but, um, I, I appreciate all the questions and interest in this topic. And, um, again, as a non-clinician, I can't, uh, I can't answer medical questions and I, you know, won't be able to answer specific questions for um, specific individuals. But um, if you have sort of research related questions, um, feel free to contact me. And, um, and if I know the answer, I'm, I'm happy to direct you.